Again, I appreciate the uh, presence of everyone here. We, we have begun a study of uh, Hebrews. <clears throat> and I would say, J.D., <clears throat> if you want to grow spiritually, teach a class. <laughs> so. The, uh, <clears throat> what's that? Yeah. You know, of the uh, New Testament letters, let's, let's set the uh, four gospel accounts to the side for the moment, and the four of the uh, remaining New Testament letters, I think um, Hebrews is one of the most incisive. You know, probably uh, uh, Romans be the other one. Uh, if you want to understand the proper relationship of the Old and New Testaments, of course, um, Hebrews would be the letter that you would go to. And, of course, you get, you know, uh, maybe from a little different uh, perspective, uh, Romans and Galatians. But uh, even though that the, uh, <clears throat> apparently the Hebrew letter was written to the Hebrews, those that were called Hebrews by outsiders in uh, Jerusalem or Palestine, that, that area, that uh, even though it was written to them, <clears throat> it is just as important for us to uh, understand the principles set forth in it today. It's no less uh, vital to our growth as uh, growth spiritually as it was to those of, of those Hebrew Christians that were having uh, admittedly severe problems dealing with uh, their practice of Christianity in a place of hostility. <clears throat> and I think we read from, uh, maybe it was last time or time before that, about the uh, problems that uh, Paul had in Jerusalem, how they were uh, antagonistic towards him, and of course antagonistic to, towards anybody that practiced Christianity, and that's what we want to do. We want to be able to practice Christianity in full conviction that we are doing the right thing. So before you jump off into this, let's have a uh, short prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the knowledge that Thou hast left for us in thy holy word, and we pray, Father, that as we study thy word, we may become more useful in the kingdom and, and more spiritually minded. Bless all those who are engaged in this study. May they benefit greatly, as indeed they should, and may we know more perfectly thy will for us in this life, that living faithfully to, the, to thee, we may attain the life come. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. <clears throat> I think where we left off last time, uh, let me see here, I've got a, a lot of pieces of paper here. <clears throat> really, I think where we were is, uh, we had already talked about uh, Let's see, we talked about, well, you remember what we talked about, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> but what language was it written in? And we won't spend much time on that, but of course what we have today is English. <laughs> but uh, our English was translated from the Koine Greek. But was it originally written in uh, Koine Greek? Well, uh, some say that it was first written in Hebrew, then translated into uh, Koine Greek. That's just pure speculation as to that. And there's really no reason that it shouldn't have been written in Koine Greek, even though it was primarily addressed to uh, Hebrew Christians, because the uh, 
Koine Greek was, as we would say today, the uh, lingua franca of the, uh, the world at that time. You know, most everyone could understand or speak Greek. You know, uh, English is, at least in the business world, is the uh, uh, lingua franca of, of business. And so it, was not, it would not be un uncommon for things like this to be written in Koine Greek. And one thing that it, it's not indicative of the fact that it was originally written in Greek, but the uh, uh, quotations from the Old Testament are in Hebrew in the Koine Greek are from the uh, Septuagint from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And that's why you can get some slight variation between the quotation in Hebrews and the actual quotation in the Old Testament because the Old Testament was translated from the Hebrew into English, whereas the quotations in Hebrews were translated from the Hebrews to Koine Greek and Septuagint, and then uh, included in the Greek Hebrews, and then translated into English. So there's kind of a certain, uh, a little extra step there. So whether it was originally uh, translated or written in Greek or Hebrews, does it matter? <laughs> we have English. <laughs> Just so long we can understand it in, in English. Now, the purpose that it was written, and of course, we mentioned the fact that these uh, Hebrews were under uh, severe trial, and not necessarily trial that, <clears throat> that they had to shed their blood for, but it, you have to kind of place yourself in, in their position. They're... They're Hebrews, or, you know, other outside people call them Hebrews. They were living in there. They, they were a minority of a minority in a area that predominantly Jewish, predominantly Jews, and predominantly who had not accepted the uh, gospel of Christ. And so you know how it is whenever... Uh, you know, you, you um, uh, have uphold a, a certain philosophy like uh, conservatism in, in, a, in a liberal world. You know how it is. You know, that what it is today now, we cannot even talk to each other. People have to find out if you're a Democrat or a Republican first. And if you're uh, Democrats, Republicans can, can't talk to them, and Democrats can't talk to Republicans. So there's there's that just natural, I guess, is natural animosity towards uh, one another. And, and these Jews who had not converted to Christianity had a animosity towards uh, the uh, Hebrews, the Hebrew Christians at that time. <clears throat> and again, think about this. Uh, situation there and they had been Christians for some time we we find out that you know they they were said that they should have been teachers and but they weren't so there had to be some time that transpired between the time they became Christians and, and that was uh, that notation was made about them so they'd been Christians some time but nothing really ever changed they were Jews still going to the temple uh, they still had the priesthood, still made sacrifices, did all things that were going on before. So in their mind, they may have said, well, what's changed? Nothing's really changed. Of course, uh, little did they know that in a few years after the book was written, there was not going to be any temple. There was not going to be any priesthood. And there was not going to be any way to practice the, uh, as prescribed in the Old Testament, to practice the Jewish religion. It was not going to be able to be done. It's going to, it was going to change. You know, we still have Jews today, but they don't practice 
the uh, religion that sets forth that in the Old Testament. They don't do that. <clears throat> but anyway, the uh, <clears throat> uh, primary objective is because of this feeling that they had, these uh, Hebrew Christians had that, you know, what's the use? We'll just go back practicing uh, Hebrew religion as we uh, always did. Uh, nothing's really ever changed, so let's just go back. So the uh, objective of the epistle was to persuade these Hebrew Christians to really stay the course. They had embarked on this uh, uh, journey as Christians, and the epistle was to encourage them to continue in that uh, course. So, all these things uh, were, that uh, discouraged them, uh, this letter sought to persuade them, really from the Old Testament scripture, scriptures, that to abandon uh, Christianity and go back into the, uh, the practice of the Law of Moses was to abandon all hope of, of salvation uh, altogether. So, in, in fulfillment of this purpose, there were certain aspects of Hebrew that were uh, laid out. There certain sections, and, and we'll go over these sections, and we'll go over them again later on, because it's always good to be reminded uh, what is actually being talked about and, and how the, uh, the epistle uh, approaches it. The first section, if you want to write this down, you can. <clears throat> the first section uh, contained in the first chapter, uh, all the first chapter and the first four verses of the second chapter. And it uh, talks about the last days <clears throat> uh, that, that he's spoken to us by his son. We're going to get into that. Uh, He's the heir of all things and, and so forth. Uh, he's the uh, effulgence of the Father. Now that's the uh, in the King James. And I think it's in the ASV too, but in the New King James it says brightness. I kind of like that word, effulgence. You know, that that uh, kind of gives a more literary force to what we would call brightness, but Anyway, uh, he just set, he sets out in that first section the uh, really the superiority of the Christ, and we'll we'll get into that in more detail. In the second sh section, that's uh, beginning with the fifth verse of chapter two through and the eighteenth. The uh, writer here he dwells on the humanity of Christ. And uh, we'll cover that more in detail, too, the, his humanity uh, and exactly what uh, impact that has on the people. And uh, it talks about how he suffered death. He had sufferings. Uh, he had sympathy. We're talking about, you know, Jesus the man and how he because he came as God in the flesh, how he brought an end to the uh, realm of Satan, brought him to an end. And he set uh, captives free. He set people free because he came as God in the form of a man. The third section is the uh, third chapter one and through four and, and verse 13. The author contrasts Christ, and of course he is called the uh, king, priest, apostle. Um, he's called all those things. He's compared with uh, Moses. Christ would be the apostle of the New Testament, if you will, and Moses, the apostle of the Old Testament, 
if you want to put it in those terms. And, you know, everybody would concede, all the uh, uh, reader to, and the reader and writer would concede that uh, Moses was a, was a faithful servant, but he was a servant. Whereas you have Christ, he's a son that, that's superior to the servant. And he's, the son is over the, the house, not the servant. The son is over the house. <clears throat> And one thing in the uh, talking about this uh, Moses, you know, he built a house, the house of the Old Testament, and, but Christ built a superior house. And uh, in the 95th Psalm, it, it speaks there that Christ course, uh, uh, alluding to the New Testament, that Christ is the, the apostle of the uh, New Testament, this new institution that's going to be formed, the, uh, the church, and it's going to far surpass the old institution, that is, the, uh, in, the institution that was uh, established by Moses. Not only is it going to be a greater institution, it's going to last longer. It's going to last uh, until it's delivered up. In fourth section, which is the fourth chapter, uh, verse 14 through the tenth verse of chapter 5, he introduced, introduces the priesthood of Christ, and we'll get into the, uh, that, of course, in greater detail later and uh, but he didn't come to this because he was the, of the uh, family or the tribe of Aaron he completely bypassed that he was appointed to that office directly by God and it was he was not necessary for him to be of the uh, uh, tribe of Aaron which he wasn't so he's like, of course, talks about him being like uh, Melchizedek. Melchizedek, it's said that he had no genealogy. Well, he did have a mother and a father because he was human, but it's never mentioned. And because of that, it's said that he is, uh, Christ is a uh, priest after the order of Melchizedek. We don't know if Melchizedek was of the tribe of Aaron. Probably not. So he didn't have any genealogy that would uh, authorize him to be a priest, but he was a priest. So Christ was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. In the fifth section, uh, we have, uh, that's from the fifth verse, chapter 11 through the uh, 20th verse of chapter 6 we have and this is not uh, uncommon for Paul he, there's a digression made from the main line of thought that he had been pursuing and it was for the purpose of admonishing uh, his Hebrew brethren to a greater diligence uh, the study of God's word and that's why he chastised them for only feeding on the milk of the word and not on the solid food of the word. They had time, but they had not uh, engaged in the study of this new word, God's word, to uh, qualify them to be teachers. In the sixth section, verses 7, uh, first 8, uh, uh, all of all of chapter seven and in the first five verses of chapter eight, he goes back to what he was talking about before. He resumes his uh, consideration of Christ's Christ's priesthood, and he shows that uh, in all respects, uh, his priesthood is superior to the priesthood 
of Aaron. In fact, in a, in a great portion of the book of Hebrews, he's showing his superiority. He's showing Christ's superiority to anything that you might uh, be compared to in the Old Testament. In the seventh section, that's the chapter 8, uh, verses 6 through 13, he considers particularly, he kind of compares and contrasts the, uh, the two covenants, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And he proves that uh, it had been God's purpose all along to give the people a better covenant than that that was given on Mount Sinai. And then he'll notice the contrast between the two. And of course, he's demonstrating the superiority of the, uh, the new covenant to that of the old covenant. In the eighth section, that's verses 9, uh, all of chapter 9, and then the first 18 verses of chapter 10, and he speaks about the um, sacrifice of Christ, the the fact that Christ is a mediator between man and God and he shows again the superiority of his offering and his administration over those uh, offerings and administration and services and what have you of the uh, mosaical uh, economy. And uh, we, we I, I'm not sure how much time, we probably spent a lot of time on all this stuff because it's, it's a pretty interesting. In the ninth section, that's the 10th chapter, verses 19 through 39, he's, he, be, he begins to make practical application, application of the uh, uh, leading points involved in the things that he's discussed before. And he dwells in particular on the, the obligations, greater obligations and greater privileges that Christians have over those of the old economy. And he warned these brethren here about the dangers of apostasy that there's nothing else to go to. And he uh, encouraged them by uh, making reference to the sacrifices that uh, others had voluntarily made uh, for the sake of Christ and that their deliverance was near at hand. They weren't going to suffer that much longer. And in fact, no matter what sufferings we have, life is such a short, uh, short duration in terms of eternity. It's, it's really not... Uh, anything at all. The tenth section, that's chapter 11, he uh, discusses and uh, illustrates fully the nature, power, and influence of faith. Of course, we have there what we call the uh, uh, those that were uh, faithful and it encourages us uh, and both to endure and enjoy even those things that uh, may not be considered all that pleasant. It's not it's not the enjoyment that you would have from you know getting a blizzard at, at uh, Dairy Queen, but <laughs> it's the uh, enjoyment that comes from knowing that you are in harmony with God's will. In the 11th section, that's uh, chapter 12, he uh, still further encourages uh, his brethren to persevere in their Christian course. And he refers to Christ as an, as an example. And he gives other illustrations of uh, faith and uh, witnesses of faith. And he reminds them that 
God's chastisement, which, you know, we must all go through, were for their good. They may not have liked the uh, oppression that they were receiving from their Jewish brethren, but he noted that these uh, chastisements, these things, these persecutions, whatever, were really uh, made them stronger. And he reminds them that uh, because they do suffer for Christ, that that uh, that those who go back into the uh, old law, there's no place any longer for their repentance. I mean, this this is it. There's no place else to go. Not only that, but he reminds them that the privileges in the, the uh, new covenant are vastly superior to the privileges that were available on the old. So he, he wants them to remain uh, diligent, faithful, and steadfast in their service to Christ. In the 12th section, chapter 13, it's a concluding chapter, of course, and just uh, there's a number of things that are mentioned there, and chiefly about uh, local things and, and what have you. And he does, in that uh, chapter, uh, make a promise of a visit, which he may or may not have made, I don't know. So therefore, uh, this book was uh, written for, for their comfort, for their encouragement, their consolation, considering all the punishment that they were enduring. And so that is something that also that is a vital uh, lesson for us today. Now, in the short time that remains, you may want to get your Bibles out here. We read in Hebrews, the first chapter, verses 1 through 4, and we'll spend a lot of time on this. It said, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past by the, to the fathers, by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, and it, it, that's a fulgence in the uh, King James and in the ASV, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majestic, uh, majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, he has by uh, he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. <clears throat> now I want to talk first about the way that it starts off. It says God. <clears throat> And, you know, the way, uh, we've mentioned before the way that uh, Paul usually starts his letter. He, he, he'll identify himself and identify who he's writing to and so forth. But here, he starts off with God. Now, that's an interesting word, wouldn't you say? <laughs> so, what did the Jew, or the Hebrew, if you want to call it that, Think about God. If you go to the uh, to Genesis, <clears throat> you read that in the beginning, God, God created. <clears throat> well, in the uh, Hebrew, God is a plural noun. 
But greet is, is a singular verb. So we have a plural engaged in a singular action. Now, does it mean when it says Elohim, the plural, is it really referring to the uh, Godhead three, or in essence, deity? It may be because we see later when when uh, talking about you know let us make man in our image. Let us is of course plural, and make man make is also plural. But if you go throughout the uh, Old Testament and you do a, a search on God, almost every case it's uh, plural. It may just be referring to the extreme, the, the majesty of the deity, if you want to call it that. And if you think about it, you know, G Jesus is only mentioned in the New Testament. The name Jesus is never mentioned in the Old Testament. And also, of course, we know in John that uh, it was the Word that was part of the creative process. And if you look uh, and do a, a very diligent study in the Old Testament, uh, you, you do get indications that there are that there's God, the Father, and God. The uh, uh, there's going to be God, the Son, but He's not called the Son in the Old Testament. He's alluded to. He's saying that uh, in Messianic prophecies that there's going to be a Son, but in the Old Testament, He's not called the Son. He's, he's prophesied that there's going to be a Son. And the word Messiah is only used two times in the Old Testament, both of them in Daniel. But in the New Testament, of course, we had uh, them saying that, you know, here is the Messiah, we found the Messiah, uh, and this Messiah who is Christ, and so forth. Christ is sort of the same word as Messiah. But you, you get into the second chapter in, of uh, uh, Genesis, and it still says God, but it says, in the New King James, it says Lord God. Actually, in the, the Hebrew, it's Yahweh, Elohim. And Yahweh, it's just a, a proper noun. It, it's not, it doesn't say anything about being singular or plural, just a proper noun. That uh, Lord God, God is still plural. And the interesting thing, at least to, to me, is uh, of course, you know, the, the uh, revelations and, and what have you, the unfolding of the scheme of redemption happened over time, a little bit by a little bit, as uh, Isaiah would say, a little bit by a little bit. So it was not fully disclosed exactly what uh, the triune nature of God was, but how was that ever decided? I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, we call, uh, uh, we say that uh, different manifestations in the Old Testament that doesn't specifically say that it's the Son. Uh, but we say that that's Jesus, Jesus Christ. But he wasn't known as Jesus in the Old Testament. Never mentioned there in the Old Testament. But we can say Jesus because we know it. Know it is. Because of what he is now, we can, can uh, relate that to what it was back there, even though the Jews didn't know it. It's kind of like, uh, let's say, uh, George Washington's the, the father of our country. But was he the father of our country when he was a little boy? We still call him the father of our country because of what he is now, or what he you know, was now. So we can call, since we know that 
these things. We know that there's God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. We can say that uh, deity, if we don't call it deity, is contained in this concept here. And that's what the uh, uh, Jew, uh, Hebrew Christians may not have fully known. But the Hebrew Christians did. They knew that. So, uh, let me just uh, quickly, I know we're kind of running over time, but, you know, just what the, the Jews thought of, uh, let's see, let's see if I can find it here. We can find uh, one of them in Exodus. Oh, that's the wrong, wrong sheet. In Exodus, well, let's let's say John one eighteen. And this is the the uh, respect that the Jews had given God. And John says, No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared Him. And you go to Exodus 33.20, and there's another reference. Uh, I meant to write it down, but I didn't. He says in Exodus 33.20, But He said, You cannot see My face, for no man shall see Me and live. So uh, the Jew was so concerned about the... Uh, how august and uh, revered God was. They wouldn't even call him by his name. That's why, why we get the name, you know, maybe in the, Old Te- in the uh, King James, Jehovah. It's really Yahweh, but the, the uh, Jews didn't pronounce that word. Now, just in case somebody brings it up, you, you go back in that uh, Exodus 33, 33rd chapter, verse 11. He says, So the Lord spoke to Moses Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend, and he would return to the camp of the servant Joshua the son of Nun, and so forth and so on. But it says here, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face, but it says in Exodus 33 20, a few chapter, uh, verses down, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and die. Is there a contradiction there? I'll answer that by asking you a question. Is it possible for two friends who are both blind to have a face-to-face meeting? Okay, we'll take this up next time. (laughs) 